Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with uh, another video on an A4000. This is the A4000 board that uh, I was able to keep from Stephen Leary. Uh, so I fixed two there in the previous uh, three part repair series, so this is part four. But this video will also be part four to the Cathars A4000 three part <laughs> repair series. So it's like a double part four. It's part four to the Stephen board, and it's uh, part four to Cathars stuff as well. Just showing you some of the extra things that I didn't include in the series on the, you know, when I did Cathar's machine there. I'm back with uh, my A4000 board, the A-hole board here as you can see. Um, now I did some extensive testing on this and it was super hot and it's my own fault. I shouldn't have left it during the day for such uh, high periods of, you know, long periods of high heat. Now what I did have, I had a fan nearby and I had a fan connected uh, just in front of the hard disk that was for mine. So, long story short, I was forming at low level formatting, which is a risky process in any case really. In modern drives, you shouldn't need to low level format. Uh, it was one of these SCSI drives here, it had a ton of bad sectors. I thought, I've got nothing to lose, the drive is knackered, let's low level format it. And uh, it was taking literally 48 hours. So, yeah, this was left on, and the, the second day, just before the 48 hour period, came down in the morning and found it had reset itself and uh, it booted up. But I noticed there was no fast RAM. There was just the two meg from the uh, 2091 that you can see here. So the 16 meg was not showing up. Now uh, I've spent a few days faffing with this, and what I mean by that is, what I didn't do is put diagram in here. What I started to do was go, well, there's something wrong with the fast RAM. So I checked literally everything, everything I could think of including swapping the chip there. So you'll know at the end of the series, I think part four or part five, we had the, this chip was a bit crooked. And I was like, well, if that's bothering me, I can swap it. Well, because we have this issue, I thought, well, let's just rule it out. So I swapped it, checked all the pads and things, reflowed everything there. It's the same problem, no fast RAM detected at all. And uh, I then went across the SIMs, checking the connection, the common connections between each SIM testing the connections on the data bus and the address bus. The address connections come from uh, Ramsey down here. There's a load of resistors on the underside, just under where Ramsey is here. 33 ohms, checked all those, checked the traces. I started looking at the RAS and the CAS signals. I was a little bit concerned in case one of these uh, these PLDs up here was the issue, because I know that uh, some, a couple of these here are responsible for the RAS and the CAS uh, signals, but that's for this, for the chip RAM. The RAS and CAS for the fast RAM, do indeed come from Ramsey. So anyway, in the meantime, I ordered a Ramsey at the same, because it was only about 20 quid, at the same time as ordering a Rev 11 Buster. So I'll cover that in a separate video. But just today, I thought, well, let's try and boot the SCSI uh, drive again. And it's not booting. It's not booting off my SCSI drive at all. It just hangs, it sits there hanging. And I started to contemplate, I wonder if the problem here is not the RAM, but something to do with Buster. Or, uh, and the data bus side of things, you know, there's some buffering goes on here. I wondered if that was the issue. So that led me to put diagram in. And let me just show you what's going on with diagram. So you'll see here, it says fast mem found between, uh, well, the full address range there, the 16 meg from 7000000, so 7FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
if we can get rid of the ram error in Diagrom, I'll be confident that this is what the issue is and I can swap these chips out. I've got some more F245s on order. I just hope that this is what the issue is. So we got that one off. So uh, let me uh, just move that out of the way. And uh, we'll just go and test it without that chip. I'll let it cool down a little bit first. So it's still giving us crazy errors. Look at that. It's just all over the place. Anyway, let's remove that other one. Well, it's neither of those chips, uh, that is for sure. So uh, I need to look back at the schematics now and work out what my next course of action is. Let me just try and come out of that. Yeah, you see, can't get out of it, it just crashes. I've removed the real time clock chip as well, just to rule that out. I'll just test the chip and then next. Make sure there's nothing crazy going on with that side of things, but I don't think there is. I think that side's all right. I'm thinking it's got to be the uh, Ramsey, actually. Yeah, you see the chip then test. Look, that's going up okay. It's going up okay. So it would appear at this stage, I think, something to do with the Ramsey. Unless I've missed anything else that sits on the data bus there that could be coming into play with the fast RAM. So a couple of thoughts spring to mind. I was going to watch this until it got to the end there and then see it shows how much non-usable memory there is. And it's testing 4 meg. And I thought, well, that will give a clue as to exactly if this is a specific address bit, if it's an addressing issue, we'll be able to work out where the fault is. But the very random nature, I sat here looking at it thinking, oh, is that going to work? I don't know. It seems to be taking a long time. And then I noticed at the top here it says, detecting motherboard memory, detected 16384. There's only one 4 meg sim in. So that is different, that changes things entirely. That leads me back into thinking about the 245. So let me switch this off again. I'm going to put all four sims in here. So they get random errors. What we might then see are specific bits like we saw at the start. And that might be the answer here. So yeah, you know, some trial and error is required and some thought as to, you know, to, in terms of what you actually see in terms of the results there. So let's see what happens now. Let's see if it detects 16 meg. That's the first thing. And then when we run the test, let's just see what happens there. It hasn't. It's detected a weird amount that. It's stopping at 743FFFFF. Yeah, it's a fast 256. Let me just reseat oh, all this memory again. Yeah, zero. So, oh, I honestly do not know what is going on here. Let's just try these one at a time. Maybe one of these sims is faulty as well. Maybe that's what killed the 245. Let's try it with that one. It's found 16 meg again, isn't it? I think. Oh, hang on, no, it started at 7C. So maybe it hasn't. Yeah, it's found 4 meg. So that one works. Let's remove that one. And uh, that one looks alright as well. That's coming up as 4 meg. So what we'll do is we'll just work our way down the slots. We'll try it with 2 in. Yeah, 4 meg fast. So we'll now try it with 2 in. Yeah, 12 meg now. So we'll try it with the 4th one in. And I'm guessing this is where it's going to go crazy maybe. Oh, how annoying. Now it's detecting all 16 meg again. Yeah, so testing there. We are seeing what I thought. We're seeing two specific, a specific bit, bit three. So you've got the upper word on the left, you've got two bytes that form the uh, upper word and two bytes that form the lower word and it goes upper lower. So it's the upper byte of the lower word and it's bit three. So I need to have a look at the schematics to work out uh, where that is. What's curious about this with all the memory in here now, we see all of the RAM unusable, which makes sense actually because it's 32 bit and we've got a problem on each uh, location there. So I went away to look at the schematics and it's cooled down obviously for a few minutes while I did that and uh, I think it's now not detecting any fast RAM at all. Yeah, no matter what sims are in what slots you get nothing there now. So I'm going to use the hairdryer I think. So let's switch this off. I'm just going to uh, Heat, uh, I will start by heating this one because I suspect this is the one. So, 
heat up. And retest it. So after warming up and then freezing this chip, we actually got it working. Um, where it was detecting the RAM, but it was still really intermittent. It's like one minute it would t it would fail right at the start on the first location, and just lock the system up, uh, and it did that a few times. I couldn't actually get it to test because what I wanted to do was get it failing uh, consistently on that particular bit, the third bit along, and then probe the uh, sim end here just to see what's actually uh, coming back on here. But that probably wouldn't help me. It's going to be this end. It's whether it's passing it from this side to this side, and on this side it's pulsing constantly because of the uh, you know it's the data bus side so whenever it's running stuff from the ROM and things like that and RAM it's a chip RAM you're gonna see this side pulsing so it's very difficult to make sense of it but what I do know is this is one of the lower uh, word chips and the other one well that one's been swapped three times up there the one up there so I'm pretty confident it isn't that one so it must be this one so I'm just gonna swap that chip and see if that makes any difference but I'm getting really cheesed off with this fault if I'm honest so I'll get a little bit of cap tape around those jumpers. Uh, yeah, this makes me laugh now. Fixed 2020. Change that to I for you. Uh, and that's probably a more accurate <laughs> description of what's happened to this, I think. So casting my mind back, this was the board that had the crazy real-time clock issue where it was, you know, affecting a data bit and stopping it from booting. But the other thing that I perhaps didn't mention uh, on my uh, video in retrospect on the repair series there is occasionally, just once or twice, it reported no fast RAM. And I was like, that's weird. Why is there no fast RAM? And I'd reseat a few things and stuff and power it back on, then it'd be all right. And this is more or less what I'm seeing now. So I think that me having left this on the test for you know two whole days it's just eventually given the ghost, you know, that, that whatever the fault was that was intermittent has become more, uh, you know, prominent. I'm sure that's what it is. So anyway, let's, let's just swap this out. You can tell that I've got that airflow a lot higher and I found that you get the temperature much quicker look. You get much quicker up to a temp and uh, yeah, it just comes off so much easier. So yeah, that's uh, an evolution for you. I found that if I go to uh, an airflow of seven on this thing, um, it gets the chips off really quick, but as a consequence of that, you're heating up quicker, you know, so you might need to consider um, preheating the board and stuff like that, and on certain boards, too much heat too quickly, you'll get delamination, but anyway, it's fine on these, so uh, I'll just clean up that with a bit of uh, braid. So the one I've just took off, I am uh, just going to stick a question mark on it actually, and do my usual uh, reverse uh, <laughs> right in there, there we go, it's got a question on it. Because I think that that might be it. Could be wrong. Could have picked the wrong chip completely, but it can't be. Uh, it can't be this one here. This has been swapped like three different times. I'm sure that chip is all right. So you can see it looks a lot straighter and tidier now. It's a bit crusty on the bottom side because the pads are obviously a bit uh, damaged there. But anyway, let's uh, let's clean that up. Anyway, fingers crossed. I hope this fixes it. Because the thing is, it might not be this. It could be anything, anything at all in the system that is connected to that data bit. It, you know, it could be, I don't know, it could be all sorts of things. I hope to goodness it's not like a Lisa fault or an Alice fault or something like that. I'm not sure whether they connect directly there or whether they've got their own tra bus transceivers or what. I need to look more at the schematics, I think. Right, let me switch the iron on. And while we're talking about airflow, I don't know if you just noticed, but while I was waffling away there, this thing cooled down super quick and switched off super quick. So that's because it's on a high airflow. So if you've got one of these and you're using it on a low airflow and you finish using it, you stick it back on here, bump the airflow up to seven to quickly cool the thing down and switch off. Otherwise, it takes a prolonged period to cool down before the... Uh, you know, it gets down to 100 degrees and then switches off, if that makes sense. So I'm um, uh, not particularly looking forward to fitting this one, just because the, the jumpers are here, look, right in the middle of the way I want to solder. So anyway, let's, let's just clean these pads up if we can. Now I'm going with one that's been previously in the other position up there on the, uh, on the board, actually, so... Yeah, hopefully it works. I'm still waiting for a supply of uh, new ones. So I'm not sure if that looks crooked or straight from the angle you're looking at. Uh, straight from straight down, it's, it's as straight as I can get it. It looks very straight. So uh, yeah, there's very little clearance here. 
I'm just going to just get crazy amount of solar. That's it. And then we'll just do the same thing down here. Oh, so I moved it then. Luckily, because it's anchored on one corner, it's uh, it's not bent out of position. So I'm just going to just uh, press that down. And we'll do the same over this side. Get some flux on it. If this doesn't work, I'm going to cry. What's really annoying is wanting to use this board, you know, I've been using it for various things here, for videos and things, and I was going to upgrade it in a few different ways and stuff, and uh, yeah, it's just hampered everything. But it's come at a time when, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, I wasn't well last year, there was a part of last year where I was really unwell, and some of the same symptoms have come back. I haven't got the leg problems I had, but I've had incredible dizziness to the point where um, if a hospital was open you know like hey, you didn't have covid i'd be going to a and e because this it's like a dizziness that's lasted for about two or three weeks now since i lasted the garden you know i did some physical you know pretty physical stuff out there um sorting the grass out a few weeks ago and i had dizziness major major dizziness when i came in where you know the following day i woke up and i couldn't see i couldn't see it was that my head was spinning that much i couldn't even see properly Anyway, let's uh, just bob in and out of those. Yeah, anyway, you get the idea. I've done one side. I'll just rotate this around a bit and do the other side, and then uh, we'll go test it. Well, now I am even more confused. I was testing it with uh, just the one uh, sim in the first slot there, and it was erroring just like before. So I put the other sims in the other slots, and so far there were no errors. So oh, I do not know what's going on here. I honestly do not know what's going on here. The, ver the very fact it's working with all four sims makes me think I've resolved it, but it should work with one sim. Why is it not working with one sim on its own? So that makes me think that this is going to fail when it gets to a specific address range, maybe. It must do. It must be mapping the sims, you know, the memory differently here, where you've got four in there. There's something different about having four sim slots populated versus one. So anyway, let's just see what happens with that now. So it's gone past the 8 meg boundary. Let's see what happens at the 12 meg boundary. But no errors so far with all four sims in. I still don't get why whether there's only one sim in, in the first sim slot as there should be, it was doing the same crazy errors. I could indicate a second fault here. Yeah, so we've gone past the 12 meg boundary as well, I think. So this is really ruddy mysterious. You know, sat here thinking about it, I'm wondering if this is uh, one of these things where they're supposed to be fitted in pairs, but they'll work individually, but maybe Diagram is testing them, expecting them to be in pairs or something. Because I'm pretty sure I've booted one of these just with one 4 meg sim, and Kickstart is usually happy. So, I honestly don't know, don't really know what's going on here. We'll just see if that gets to the end, if it does, I might... Uh, Remove three of them again and just test with one just to show you the crazy behaviour when you've got one in. Yeah, there we go. So, it looks like I nailed it with that chip. I'm now retesting with just one sim, which it has detected. But when I did this a minute ago, it did error. It did error. So unless we've got an intermittent fault on top of this. Now look at that. Look at that. So... What would cause that? Unless it's another deficiency, like say in Diagram, where it's kind of expecting all four slims to be. And it says at the top there, detected 16384. So maybe there is another issue with this. It seems to think all four slots are filled when they aren't. Is it because we're still missing some 245 from Buster there? I don't see how. I don't see how. Let's uh, just test uh, some games out on this. So if we're going to a memory. Yeah, look, it's saying four meg fast. Let's test all. So yeah, I would suggest that that's perhaps uh, another tweak that needs to do into diagram. That if you've only got one four meg sim, there, there's a scenario whereby it detects sixteen meg, and I think that might be because I've got those two two four five is missing. 
next to Buster. That's the only thing I can think. It'll be interesting to see if the behaviour changes when I get those two four fives back on. But that's how it would appear to, uh, well, that's how it looks to me. So I cleaned up around here with cotton buds. There's still a bit of flux, so I'll just give that one more pass there. Um, and I cleaned around here, but I've not gone around with a toothbrush yet. I'll do that last. So, you know, there's still a little bit of flux around there. It looks a bit of a mess. So the next thing I want to do is just clean up the underneath of that chip there. Now, uh, it's important to note that when one bus transceiver fails and the system crashes, other bus transceivers can fail. So you never know, there could be an issue with one of these ones on the Zorro. And this is one of the original ones. One of the ones that was on the Zorro has gone back on there. Because, as I say, I'm still waiting for some spares. But I do have one or two of the uh, 245s that have been... Uh, you know, remove them from various places on both these boards when I was working on them earlier in the repair series there. So this one's got a one written on it because it was the first one I took off from the Buster area here. Came from this spot, I think, actually. So, yeah, it's a bit of guesswork, really, uh, putting these back on like this. You know, will it introduce a fault? Won't it? I don't know. Soon find out. I'm avoiding the pin that I've anchored there just for a second. Because otherwise it may move fairly easily. I should be using my solder uh, extractor here, my fume extractor. I should bomb in and out of these a little bit. Oh, you can see that side done. So I'll just do that for the other three sides. So I've got a full 16 meg fitted there and I'm testing with Diagram. Now the thing I was wondering about earlier on is how does it know how much RAM there is there? SIMs have, and I'll show you in a second, they have resistors on there that identify what type of SIM it is, how much memory is on there, uh, and other parameters and stuff, maybe uh, the timings and things. Uh, let's just move the cursor on. You can see straight away though, it's showing 16 meg there. Um, sorry, I sidetracked myself there. Yeah, the resistors that are fitted onto SIMs that identify the type of SIM, how much RAM, etc. They're not used on the Amiga at all, as far as I can see. It looks like it's just the jumper, which toggles between uh, 1 meg and 256k SIMs. Now, the thing that I'm curious about, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is, is, the, is why does this fail here? So we'll do test detected fast RAM. And I'll report back when that gets to the end. And after 10 minutes, we've got a bill of good health. So I'm going to do the same thing. Well, it won't take as long. I'm going to remove three of the sims and we'll try it again. So let's uh, see what it reports now. Bear in mind, the only thing that's different here is I fitted the 245s related to Buster. In fact, it is showing 4 meg down there. Previously, it was showing 16 meg when those two were missing. So I think this kind of proves that the memory testing in diagram is okay. Let's just uh, test that. Hopefully. Oh no, look, we're getting errors. We're getting errors. That is interesting. So there is a problem with uh, the memory test in Diagram, I think. Unless there's a fault on this board, but I'll be honest, this part of the video here, I'm filming like a month or two after having shown you the actual repair. I've been using this a lot, and it's been rock solid. So let me just try adding one more sim in case it's, uh, it's looking at these in pairs, maybe. But I don't think so. I think it's, it's looking at the whole... Uh, four uh, slots there. So the same again, this time with the uh, two modules and it's detecting those. You can see it's starting at seven, eight, zero, 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 zero. And it's detected eight meg. So uh, this is very unusual. Why was it, why would it fail? Yeah, look, it's failing again. It's really weird. I've started to think there's still an additional fault with this somewhere but I don't know what, what it would be. So back with all four again. And the interesting thing here, by the way, if I only test with, the, say, four or eight or 12 meg, every other memory test program passes fine. You can boot the system and use the RAM, no issues, you know, and let's say software testing there works fine, so I'm inclined to think it's actually uh, a deficiency with this version of Diagram. Look, it's working okay again, now all four slots are populated. 
So I guess uh, a point of interest, something else I've done which I can share with you, is I removed the older uh, Rev 9 Buster, I think it was, and fitted a Rev 11. Uh, the interesting thing with this is, can you see it says Amiga Tech? So I think they only started stamping things with Amiga Tech just before they stopped trading. Um, was this at the point where they were sold to uh, Viglin or whoever it was, I forget who it was now. Um, Amiga Tech, is that where they changed this, the company split in two or something? But I don't know. Again, post your comments down below. I can't remember. My history on Commodore is a bit rusty. And you can see it's got a, a warranty thing here from Analogic UK. Uh, I'd love to know where Analogic get all these uh, parts from. Maybe they were a Commodore dealer back in the day, or maybe they've bought a load of Commodore stock, but they seem to have vast amounts of quantities of uh, all the different uh, chips for these boards. I hope they're not stripping A4000s down for parts. That might be a possibility, but where would they be getting them all from? I don't know. Just a final test there, booting uh, from hard disk, as you can see. I'll put my kickstart ROMs back in now. Yep, there we go. As you can see, everything's fine. We've got our RAM up there. It's, uh, it's running fine. So Kath has also sent me uh, this. It's a Zorro 3 Big RAM 256 meg board. Uh, it's from individual computers. They make lots of really cool stuff for Amigas and uh, CCT4s. So I slide it along there and into the slot there. There we go, it makes a nice fit. Now if these were misaligned here, it might not be um, perfectly straight. It's going to be out by a tiny, a tiny fraction, but anyway, that went in there nice and straight. So yeah, it's working fine with the Z3 RAM there. So as you can see, that's been on test for a while. I would say that's taken at least half an hour to get to where it's at at the moment, maybe 40 minutes, uh, around 2.3. So it's, you know, it's only on the, the third pass, I think, or is it the second pass? Yeah, I think it's on the second pass, actually, because obviously you've got a significant amount of RAM to test there, 272 meg, it's crazy. So the other thing I'm going to do while I'm here is I've bought a brand new 68060 myself. Um, either for a board like this for 4000 maybe or uh, for one of the terrible fire accelerators so I'm using my uh, PGA uh, removal tool here it will just slide I think just in the side here if you just find the gap like that carefully get it in there and just prise a little bit alternate sides um, and I'm just going to swap over to the other one I've bought it should be um, a full rev 6 with MMU and FPU. So despite the fact this uh, new CPU was installed on a piece of foam, the pins are just all over the place. You might not be able to tell. They look fairly straight but it's like some are kind of like bent a little bit that way, some are bent a little bit that way, some are bent a little bit that way. They're just like all over. If I was to hazard a guess, this isn't going to be a genuine chip and someone's deliberately bent the pins different directions so that you either damage it, install it, or just give up and go, oh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i do this another time or something, I can't bother doing it just now. Um, so the uh, approach I'm going to go with here is just do a row at a time. Try and bend them, which I've done to a degree. You can see there's a few out here on this side. Uh, and try and get one strip of turn pin on. Yeah, you can see that pin there is not going in. I can actually use the turn pin if I need to to bend the whole strip, uh, just to, you know one way or the other, depending on which orientation it uh, needs moving. Because every single one of these is bent. Because you you need patience. If you uh, just rush this, you will break a pin off. And if you break a pin off, you're going to be uh, pretty upset. So thanks to the help of uh, Kaffer's, um, well Chucky's board and Kaffer's machine here, I've got it working now. Uh, I'll show you the best way to strain the pins on these in a minute because I kid you not, I have spent literally two hours, two hours straightening the pins on that. It was crazy. It wasn't just like one or two bent. It, it was like I say, there were a number bent sort of like that, there were a number bent like that, there were a number bent like that, all out in different directions with one or two that were totally mangled. So uh, I can only guess that that's the way it was stored because it is actually a genuine R6. Uh, I'll post the link to the seller as well. Now I'm not saying that the seller sells all genuine R6s but uh, that's what he was advertising. He sold quite a lot of them. He had like I don't know hundreds for sale, sold a hundred and when I was looking at his feedback they were all positives. There was not one single negative. So I would suggest that 
this particular seller is selling genuine R6s. So the other thing here, I had to take the ROMs out and put Chucky's diagram in because it was just black screen. It wouldn't boot. I had the hard disk, uh, had the hard disk uh, compact flash, uh, you know, ID thing in there, and uh, it wasn't even flashing. I thought, what's going on here? Maybe I've been sent a duff one, and I, you know, I felt the top of it. It was just lukewarm, not hot. I thought, I wonder if it's faulty. So I took it out, checked the pins, they're all straight, put it back in, tried again, just the same. And then uh, I inspected around here, I thought, I wonder if there's a jumper, if you've got, depending on which one you've got, whether you've got the one with the MMU and the uh, FPU. And on the underside, it says, if you're using a full 68060 with the um, MMU and stuff, you need a custom kickstart. So I thought, well, Chucky's diagram will probably detect it. And uh, if I switch it on, you can see straight away, that's normal behavior. So that gave me some confidence that yeah it's working, it's booting, just gotta wait for it to boot now. And if we go in there, uh, somewhere here in a minute it says, where is it now? Oh it's up the top, 68060 MMU not checked, Rev6 FPU. So uh, anyway, let's. I don't know what other tests we can do in here to do with that system info maybe. Yeah, I mean it's showing the same thing there, you can just about see here. It's, uh, CPU 68060, Rev6, FPU 68060, MMU not checked. Uh, why would it not be checked? Do you have to check it? I don't know. The main thing is it's showing it as a 68060, showing it as a Rev6 FPU. Um, so I would assume that that's probably a good CPU. I won't know until I get uh, you know a board of my own for my, I don't know, 1200 or something like that at some point in future. So I put back in the original Kickstart ROMs there and this original 68060 and you can see it's booted okay. So um, the main purpose of this video, there were just a few odds and ends. I was going to relocate the um, cables that go through the front because they don't go through the little gaps that I showed, although they will fit there safely and securely and shouldn't get snagged on anything. But uh, yeah, someone said to stick them down the little, uh, this little gap down the side of the drive. That's perhaps the best place to put them, I think. I think he was saying there was a square hole to shove them through. There actually isn't. There's no holes anywhere around there, but you could stick them through the little gap next to the drive. So we'll do that. But the main thing is, you saw in, I think it was part two, we replaced a resistor on the uh, one of the 12 volt lines. I can't remember if it was the minus 12 or the plus 12. There's a one ohm resistor. And I fitted a slightly smaller component, like an 80805 or something, which I think someone pointed out helpfully that it was uh, an eighth of a watt instead of a quarter of a watt. Um, now, whilst it's working okay, that acts as a fuse. You never know, under a, a bit of load over a prolonged period of time, it could just burn out again. Um, the reason it probably went was because of it, well, the, def the reason it definitely went was the electrolyte. The electrolyte would have caused a bit of uh, an increase in uh, current around there, and that's why that one ohm fuse uh, resistor went. You know, it's acting like a fuse. So I've got a slightly larger one, I think it's 1206 or something, that um, is a quarter of a watt. And I thought it would be a good idea just for, you know, safety concern and stuff. Not really safety, but in terms of Cather's using this, I'd hate for him to use this for six months and then find his audio goes again because that resistor's burnt out. So, uh, yeah, it's painful for me because I have to take it all to pieces again. Um, but I won't show you or bore you with the teardown and the reassembly. We'll just quickly whip the board out, replace that resistor and uh, reassemble it again. I'll just show you it working. So uh, this is the one here. You can see uh, one, quite literally, one ohm. It's uh, super small, so let's uh, just get that off. Um, I'm thinking the new uh, resistors might even be too big. <laughs> I don't know, I might uh, have looked on, it might be 1206. Um, because whilst there are uh, schematics for this, there are no, well, as far as I understand, there are no proper service manuals that contain all the parts lists and all that. Has that come off? No, it's there, look. Yeah, just grab it off, there we go. Just stick it on there. In fact, it's tombstoned on the end here, look. Oh, go off, there we go. That's it. And uh, I'll remove the solder with a bit of braid on one side, probably. I should add some dedicated flux because, oh yeah, there it's all right. I was gonna say, it doesn't always um, mop up very well. So, uh, it's obviously important you get it the right way up because you can't see the, uh, rating on it there we go um, so what I'm gonna do here and I'll reflow one or two of the components around here as well because you might know it's one of the two of these resistors like those there see where I took these 1k ones off the solder looks a bit blobby and I could just completely forgot to revisit that so uh, let's uh, 
let's just heat this side here get the one side to join, I'll try and get it nice and straight I've got quite a big tip on the iron now actually, I changed this the other day for something else I was doing uh, I'm not sure it was a good idea now we'll get a little bit of flux on there just to level it off but at least you could see um, you know in terms of attention to detail and I'm not being big headed here somebody else pointed this out if it wasn't somebody else I wouldn't have thought about it too much um, but it is important to me that uh, with this uh, certainly that it goes back and there's uh, you know low risk of uh, a repeat failure on that resistor there We'll flow that one as well, I think. The other thing is, you know, with these videos, I don't always get everything right. I don't always get everything right first time either. Um, sometimes uh, I'll revisit things after the video. I don't always do an update, but I'll do certain things. I'll either take feedback into account that someone's provided, you know, a suggestion, something I might have missed, etc. But with this one, I wanted to show you the stuff with that 68060 anyway. Um, so uh, it's just meant we got an additional uh, video out of this before it goes back to Cathars. I just need to inspect that now, make sure the solder's okay there, but you can see we've swapped that resistor out. It's a good job it did come in here because this plastic sheet was the wrong way around. It was like the other way. You can see, can you see that on this side here, there's like halves. That half was on the, the, that side over there. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how I didn't notice that. I'm amazed nobody else pointed it out. Maybe I didn't show that going back in. Anyway, anyway, it's just another example of how I don't always get everything right. Um, every, nobody's perfect. Whilst I am persistent enough to generally make sure I nearly, I nearly always fix everything, there's very, very little things I haven't been able to fix on my uh, channel. That's just from persistence. Anybody can do that. You can do that. You may think you cannot do something. That is rubbish. You can do anything. It is all a matter of time, experience and patience. And you need to learn, obviously, what you need to learn. You'll make mistakes along the way. But uh, as I am uh, always doing, but anybody can do anything. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, is the main thing that comes through from my videos to give you confidence. Uh, maybe not to dive in and look at someone like this if you've never done one before, but certainly to have a go at repairing your own things, you should be able to have some confidence to start with the basic things. And you know, as you, you gain experience, you'll work your way up to something like this without an issue. And the other correction here, I'll perhaps uh, stick it up top left, thanks to whoever pointed this out. Can you see the little metal uh, clips here? That goes over the PCB there. I had it like that. Can you see that? That's misaligned. It goes like that. So, I mean, it wasn't a problem because there were no cards in there at that point in time. So, in terms of, uh, yeah, that wouldn't have made any difference to anything, but it will do. Um, when uh, you've got cards in there, anyway, sorry, you can't see what I'm doing here from the screws going in. Another correction here as well, Peter Mulholm pointed out, there isn't actually an additional Butterworth filter. There is another op-amp stage, hence the little op-amp down here. Um, but there's no additional filtering going on. Anyway, that's working. It was just a quick test before I stick the uh, drives back in. We'll service the floppy drive next. So I've got the floppy drive out, it uh, looks like a chin-on is it? Yeah it is, it's a chin-on. Uh, you can tell because they always have this little indent thing with the screws on the side here. So there were just four screws holding it into the uh, assembly there, but if we just get these uh, two side ones out, there might be one on the back, let's have a look in a sec. So with these here, I sort of explained this in the previous video, if you just uh, push down a little bit and pull at the same time, do the same on the other side. Yeah, the front will then carefully uh, come off. Uh, now hopefully, is there anything in holding this in? Yeah, yeah. There's a screw there, it's like the 354, maybe it is the 354. So, first uh, observation, it's got an SMB cap there, so you might need to replace that. Um, and then, like all these uh, drives, it just looks like a 354, this to me. Um, caps here, the through hole type, there's three over there, two here. So, uh, those are the sorts of things, if you get in a drive that's not working, replace those. We'll just clean off the old grease here with a cotton bud, stick some uh, molly cotton there, clean up the heads, and I'll get some contact cleaner to the switches. Can you see the fluff and dust around here? 
Yeah, so that needs cleaning out with the cotton bud, but we'll get some contact cleaner into those. This looks like the high density one. Um, I think Kath has mentioned he thought it was HD because it's got an extra switch here for the uh, either double density or high density. So I'll uh, start by uh, just cleaning uh, around there actually. Um, we'll just, so we'll just clean up here, I've just cleaned those switches with a bit of um, IPA there to the top so we'll get some contact cleaner in a sec. Just uh, lift that head a little bit just to get uh, down right into the back there. So you've got your track zero sensor at the back there, you want to make sure you've not got any uh, dust particles in that. You could just uh, blow the drive like this, um, just to make sure you've uh, got any uh, dust out of the little corners and things like that. I mean you can see how much uh, dust was inside there anyway. Clean off the uh, old uh, grease off here. If you put uh, pressure on this as you move it like that you can see the whole carriage moves. And that's useful to get up there, can you see that extra grease at the top? Sorry I'm perhaps just off camera a little bit. Yeah, here, look. So I've got a little bit of uh, mollycott here. We'll just uh, get some of this onto there. Now we can do the same thing here, just put a bit of pressure on it like that. And we can rotate it a little bit. I'm going to get some more on there, I think. And the other thing we'll just do is get a little bit of grease onto that bar there, actually. You might want to consider a bit of grease on here where these uh, go in and out of there but it should be all right I think I don't think uh, I'm gonna bother with that. Now my contact cleaner has run out so I'm gonna get a tiny drip of uh, deoxit onto those actually. Yeah there we go and then uh, just do a bit of that and clean off the excess with uh, cotton bud in a sec. Yeah there we go that should do and we'll do the same over here on this one. This is like say the high density uh, switch or the density switch detection. So it's uh, unusual because obviously most Amiga drives are just 880k, this one obviously is like 1.6 uh, meg. It must be able to format high density discs. Uh, I might try that. And the one thing we didn't show you very well on the last video, can you see here this protrudes a little bit. So yeah, you know, it was bent, this was bent right up here, so that it wasn't even in the hole there, it was barely even pointing in that direction. So uh, yeah, you should be able to feel that there. The other thing I'll point out is I've moved this power connector here, so as the lid sits, this will get trapped in this area here. Because, let me show you, if this is over here, look at this, right, these do protrude a little bit. If this was to go like this on here, you could literally feed 5 or 12 volts somewhere, into the uh, system there. I might even just uh, put a bit of captain tape over this or something just here just to hold it onto this drive because you know what I would hate that to cause a major problem there. And you know what I am going to stick this down here. Um, it's pretty sturdy stuff this tape just because I wouldn't want that going anywhere near the uh, Zorro uh, bridge board there. So I think someone was suggesting these went through just some hole. Well you can't fit them through it there there's nowhere else to fit them. You can fit them through here, but look, yeah, they're pretty tight. I don't know, I think they're better off going through those gaps there, if I'm honest. So Cathas did send me a, a scan doubler, which I'll show you in a sec. Um, I was going to test it, but I haven't got time. I've got too many things on the go. The other thing Cathas sent me, and I'm not going to test this, I'm just going to show you. It's an Indivision AGA Mark uh, II CR from individual computers. So this clips over uh, Lisa. I think uh, it fits like that onto the board. You can see a picture of it uh, assembled there. Um, if you saw the uh, little ROM board I produced for the Neo Geo uh, there, you know, it converted from a, that type of CPU, PLCC CPU, to allow you to, um, you know, use a DIP ROM so you didn't have to use an SMD ROM on the board there. Um, on my board, you know, this just clipped over the uh, 68000 there but in this case this obviously flips over Lisa and you've got a DVI port there so it's a scan doubler you know it kind of like it doubles the frequencies there to make it work with the DVI monitor. Um, now I do have a DVI monitor but it's a bit of a rigmarole to set all this up and stuff and um, from experience these things don't always clip on very well. You can see what they've done with this they did exactly the same thing I did. Can you see the little um, L shaped things here? They've smoothed them down with a file and I'm guessing he might have touched this with a um, sanding belt. It's a little bit chipped off there, can you see that? I'm not sure what that's all about. <coughs> it might be to accommodate a component or something on the board, I don't know. It's a bit weird. 
Um, but yeah, anyway, nevertheless, that's that. So I'll stick that back in this ESD bag and uh, we'll put that back in. I've got no reason to doubt that would work. The one thing I would say is if you're going to fit it in something like this, I'd be tempted to, you know, run it out the back of one of the plates here. So I'm blocking it with a the thing there, but, you know, stick it out there. Stick it, get a uh, blanking plate, cut a hole for that and mount it on one of those. Probably that's, I think, what I would do. The other reason to go back in here, as you can see, I've moved it down a slot. I'm just testing this expansion ram on its own, this fast ram here on its own, but in each of the slots. So it's working fine in that slot. As you can see, but I'll just uh, proceed to go through the other two slots as well. Once that's done, we'll move on to the power supply thing. We'll set a quick look inside there. I'll just test the ESR of some of the caps, I think. So there's literally one screw on the outside of the case that holds that in. The other one is the one that goes through the uh, lid as well. Um, so we've got the power supply uh, out there. Let's uh, just unscrew these screws here. I'm guessing it might be a bit dusty inside here. Hopefully not too dusty. So that looks like that just hinges up, look, does it come off? There we go. Yeah, so you can see we just need a little clean in there. The caps are looking pretty good actually. I don't see anything domed or anything like that. So you know what, I'm not going to go any further than that at this stage because I'm happy everything looks alright. It you know, performs remarkably and the lack of dust inside here, uh, I mean look at the fan there. It makes me think it's hardly had much use, this. You know, if this had been really heavily used, there would be a lot of dust in there. There's hardly anything. Um, I doubt it will need to change these caps in the next uh, 10 years or so, you know. He could do as a preventative thing. If this was mine, I don't think I'd bother. I honestly don't think I'd bother at this point in time. Um, he did say he was going to replace the fan. Um, my suggestion to him, if he wants to avoid having to, the rig more oven to remove this, is literally snip the wires here, cut the wires a little bit shorter on the other fan so they're about, you know, it's this length here, maybe a bit longer, and just join them up with a little bit of heat shrink uh, tubing. Um, mind you, you probably still need to get the board out. Do you? Maybe not. I think if you undo the screws here, the fan may slide sort of outwards. It might be a bit tight. Uh, you might have to remove the, the power switch here to assist with that, but. You could probably swap that fan with something quieter, a more modern fan, and as I say, without taking the board out by just uh, splicing the wires there, but use heat shrink to join those up. So if you wanted to recap this, I mean you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten electrolytics on there. So I gave the side of that a wipe, can you see? It was like black, it was like some flux marks or something. Presumably when someone was uh, working on it previously, they uh, had flux on their hands and then uh, maybe got it on the power supply when they were putting the board back in. And you can see a little bit of uh, corrosion here, so uh, I'm just gonna go over that with the uh, wire brush. It's just a little bit on the outside of the back of the case, where it joins the case there. You don't see this, it's internal. At least I think it's internal. Again, we'll just wipe over that with a cotton bud and some WD-40. What we're trying to do is just mitigate, uh, you know, full-blown cor corrosion stein on that part of the uh, back there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, the pen's looking okay there, actually. Um, so, I've just given it a light clean. I cleaned with a little bit of vinegar and I'm just cleaning with some uh, IPA now. But I think that's okay. I don't see, you know, it's not like corrosion's got up and down all the pins. It's maybe just a little bit of light oxidisation. You can see those looking super gold looking there. Can you see that? There's no issue there. If anything, it might just be my connector was not making uh, a good uh, connection. If you try and fold it a bit, you can kind of get it in there just to give them a little bit of a general rub. Just make sure there's no uh, bits of paper or anything in there afterwards. So in terms of straightening the pins on a 68060 or an 030 or an 040, um, there's a number of different things you can do. Obviously, you know, you, if you see the odd one, you can get some little uh, fine nose uh, pliers like this and find the pin and, and just straighten it a little bit. Uh, if it, sometimes they'll be like that, you know, so instead of being perfectly straight, it'll be like that, like a really weird bent shape. And this is the sort of thing you can use, you know, you just grab the pin and squash it totally flat. You've got to make sure, you obviously, you've got these 90 degrees perpendicular so that you're going to straighten it in a straight line rather than at an angle. Um, 
so that's one thing but when the pins are bent all over the way like that you need to what I've done is I went through my screwdrivers and I've tried to find one experimentation with one that is exactly the right width to as you put it here watch it just slides nicely you can feel a bit of resistance from the top row and a bit from the bottom row um, and there were lots of these where when I was putting it in it just would not squeeze in there at all and I literally went like this dragged it across here like this I can feel it sticking a bit on one or two now because they're still not perfectly straight but they're straight enough to go into the socket and you've got to do it in different orientations so you go like this way first like this across here then do this way across these like that to make sure to straight that way it was uh, some of them were incredibly bent actually and after spending I would say 15 to 20 minutes doing that I solved it but prior to that I was trying everything you know you, I, mean, I was doing things like this you know there was one row on the inside bent so I was like putting this ruler in and trying to just put a little bit of pressure that's impossible with so many pins like that so this way is the ideal way uh, and as I say, you know, some experimentation may be required to get a screwdriver that is, because I'm not sure what size this is, just the right uh, width there to, you know, to go in between like that. Uh, finally, we'll just stick that there on the inside of the lid out of the way. You might want to stick it on the back or something if it's your own, but um, yeah, I think that was what I agreed with Kath Kathers. It's not that important, really, because... Uh, get one of those and it can say it's been recapped and it may well not have been recapped you never know so i stick these things back into the uh, esd bag here uh, and then we've got the old uh, super buster there it's got a key here for the uh, key lock stick that in there there's the ram repaired i've stuck a, log a label on it that says repaired and then uh, one two three four five Sims here. Um, yeah, so uh, let's carefully put this in there. And we're all done, so I'm going to package that back up, um, stick the Sims and things in a separate bag. I've took the memory expansion out, put that back in its uh, box here, and stick that in there as well. Uh, I just don't want any of those memory modules or anything coming out during transit. And you know, it's probably a good idea to remove Zorro cars and things because. If there is some sort of impact, you know, maybe you could damage something somewhere. So the other thing I would say to Cathars is, do make sure that, that when you put the RAM back in, just uh, ex uh, you know investigate over where the uh, CPU board is and just make sure, press it down, make sure it's totally flat and flush before you first power it on, but it should be okay. If you would like to support the channel just for one dollar a month please see the Patreon link down below. I've lost that many Patreons since Covid started and in the last week I've lost about 10 Patreons so I mean it's understandable, it's difficult times, everyone's short of money, lots of people losing jobs and stuff. Hopefully you found that interesting, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.